the signs of the times chapter 100 august the 21st 1879 the sufferings of christ continued by mrs Iggy white the fearful hour in gethsemane is past our divine savior has accepted the cup to drain it to the dregs in behalf of man he has conquered in the hour of temptation Serenity and calmness are now seen in the pale and blood-stained face. And the third time he comes to his disciples and find, finds them overcome with sleep. Sorrowfully and pityingly, he looked upon them and said, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Even while these words were upon his lips, he heard the footsteps of the mob that was in search of him. Judas took the lead and was closely followed by the high priest. Jesus aroused his disciples with these words, Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. The countenance of Christ wore an expression of calm dignity. The traces of his recent agony were not visible as he walked forth to meet his betrayer. Jesus steps out in front of his disciples and inquires, Whom seek ye? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. At these words, the mob staggered backward, and the priests, the elders, the hardened soldiers, and even Judas fall powerless to the ground giving ample opportunity for Christ to release himself if he chose. But he stands as one glorified amid the, that course and hardened man. As Jesus said, I am he, the angel which had ministered to him in his anguish moved between him and the murderous mob. They see a divine light glorif glorifying the Savior's face and a dove-like form overshadow him. Their sinful hearts are filled with terror. They cannot stand for a moment in the presence of divine glory, but fall as dead men to the ground. The angel withdrew and left Jesus standing calm and self-possessed with the bright beams of the moon upon his pale face and still surrounded by the prostrate helpless men, while the disciples were too much amazed to utter a word. As the angels remove the hardened Roman soldiers that start, start to their feet, and with the priests and Judas, they gathered about Christ as though ashamed of their weakness and fearful that he would yet escape out of their hands. Again, the question is asked by the world's redeemer, whom seek ye? Again, they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. In this hour of humiliation, Christ's thoughts are not for himself, but for his beloved disciples. He wishes to save them from any further trial of their strength. Judas, the betrayer of our Savior, does not forget his part but comes close to Jesus and take his hand as a familiar friend and bestowed the traitor's kiss. Jesus says to him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? His voice trembled with sorrow as he addressed deluded Jesus, betrayed thou the Son of Man with a kiss? This most touching appeal should have aroused the conscience of Judas and touched his stubborn heart. But honor, fidelity, and even human tenderness seem to have left him. He stood bold and defiant, showing no disposition to relent. He had given himself up to the control of Satan, to work wickedness, and he had no will to resist. Jesus did not resist the traitor's kiss. In this, he gives us an example of forbearance, love, and pity. That is, without a parallel. Though the murderous strong are surprised and awed by what they have seen and felt, 
the assurance and hardihood returns as they see the boldness of Judas in touching the person of Christ, whom so recently they had seen glorified. They lay violent hands upon Jesus and are about to bind those precious hands that ever been employed, that had ever been employed in doing good. At the disciples, as the disciples saw that band of hardened men lie prostrate and helpless on the ground, they thought surely the master would not suffer himself to be taken. The same power that prostrated that hireling mob could have kept them, kept them there, and Jesus could have passed on his way unharmed. They are disappointed and indignant as they see the cards brought forward to bind the hands of him whom they love. Peter, in his vehement anger, strikes rashly and cut off, cut off an air of the servants of the high priest. When Jesus saw what Peter had done, he released his hands, already held by the Roman soldiers, and saying, Suffer he thus far. He touched the air of the wounded man, and instantly it is made whole. Even to his enemies who are bound to take his life, he here gives unmistakably evidence of his divine power. Jesus said to Peter, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my father and he shall present, presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? And thus it must be. The cup which my father had given me, shall I not drink it? Jesus said unto the chief priests and the captains of the temple, who helped compose that mother strong, I ye come out as against a thief with a sword and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. When the disciples saw that Jesus didn't deliver himself from his enemies, but permitted himself to be taken, they forsook him and fled, leaving their master alone. Christ had foreseen this distortion and had told them in the upper chamber before it took place of what they would do. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is not come, that ye shall be scattered every man to his own and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. The Savior of the world was hurried to the judgment hall of an earthly court, there to be derided and condemned to death by sinful men. There the glorious Son of God was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. He bore insults, mockery and shameful abuse until his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Who can comprehend the love here displayed? The angelic host beheld with wonder and with grief him who had been the majesty of heaven and who had worn the crown of glory now wearing the crown of thorns, a bleeding victim to the rage of an infuriate mob who were fired to insane madness by the wrath of Satan. Behold, the patient suffer. Upon his head is the thorny crown. His life blood flows from every lacerated vein. All this was in consequence of sin. Nothing could have induced Christ to leave his honor and majesty in heaven and come to a sinful world to be neglected, despised, and rejected by those he came to save, and finally to suffer upon the cross. But eternal redeeming love, which will ever remain a mystery. Wonder, O heavens, and be astonished, O earth. Behold the oppressor and the oppressed, a vast multitude enclosed the Savior of the world. Mocking and jeering are mingled with coarse oaths of blasphemy. His lowly birth and humble life are commented upon by unfeeling wretches. His claim to be the son of God is ridiculed by the chief priests and elders. 
and the vulgar jest and insulting derision has passed from lip to lip. Satan was having full control of the minds of his servants. In order to do this effectively, effectually, he commences with the chief priests and elders and imbues them with religious frenzy. They are actuated by the same satanic spirit which moves the most vile and hardened wretches. There is a corrupt harmony in the feelings of all, from the hypocritical priests and the elders down to the most debased. Christ, the precious Son of God, was led forth, and the cross was laid upon his shoulders. At every step was left blood which flowed from his wounds. Trunged by an immense crowd of bitter enemies and unfeeling spectators, he is led away to the crucifixion. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. His sorrow disciples follow him at a distance, behind the mother of strong. He is nailed to the cross and hung suspended between the heavens and the earth. Their hearts are busting with anguish as their beloved teacher is suffering as a criminal. Close to the cross are the blind, begotten, faithless priests and elders, taunting, mocking and jeering, thou that destroys the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou, if thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mock him with the scribes and elders, said he saved others. Himself he cannot see. If he be the king of Israel, let him not come down from the cross. And we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Not one word did Jesus answer to all this. Even while the nails were being driven through his hands, and sweats of drops of agony were forced from his pores. From the pale, quivering lips of the innocent sufferer, a prayer of pardon in love was breathed for his murderers. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. All heaven was gazing with profound interest upon the scene. The glorious redeemer of a lost world was suffering the penalty of man's transgression of the father's law. He was about to ransom his people with his own blood. He was paying the just claim of God's holy law. This was the means to which an end was to be finally made of sin and Satan, and his vile host to be vanquished. Oh, was there ever suffering and sorrow like that endured by the dying Savior? It was the sense of his father's displeasure which made his cup so bitter. It was not bodily suffering which so quickly ended a life of Christ upon the cross. It was the crushing weight of the sins of the world and a sense of his father's wrath that broke his heart. The father's glory and sustaining presence had left him and despair pressed its crushing weight of darkness upon him and forth from his pale and quivering lips the anguish. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus had untied with the Father. Jesus had united with the Father in making the world. Amid the agonizing suffering of the Son of God, blind and deluded men alone remain unfeeling. The chief priests and the elders revile God's dear Son, while in his expiring agony, yet inanimate nature groans in sympathy with her bleeding, dying author. The earth trembles, the sun refused to behold the scene. The heavens gathered blackness, angels have witnessed the scene of suffering until they can no longer, they can look on no longer and hide their faces from the horrid sight. Christ is in despair. 
he is dying. His father's approving smile is removed. And angels are not permitted to lighten the gloom of the terrible hour. They could only behold in amazement their love, commander suffering the penalty of man's transgression of the father's law. Even doubt assailed the dying son of God. Doubt. He could not see through the portals of the tomb. Bright hope did not present to him his coming forth from the tomb, a conqueror, and his father's acceptance of his sacrifice. The sin of the world with all its terribleness was felt to the utmost by the son of God. The displeasure of the father of sin, for sin, and its penalty, which was death, were all that he could realize through this amazing darkness. He was tempted to fear that sin was so offensive in the sight of his father that he could not be reconciled to his son. The fierce temptation that his own father had forever left him caused the piercing cry from the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me to be continued?